Hi, my name is David, and I try to play guitar. I'm not very good, as you can tell. One day, I saw a video of blues great Joe Bonamassa getting very technical about his guitar amplifiers. For guitar player, that guy really knows his stuff about amps. He inspired me to learn more. But to really understand guitar amps, you need to take them apart and put them back together. I watched hundreds of videos. I read all kinds of books. From Craigslist and eBay, I bought a used soldering iron, some old voltmeters, an ancient oscilloscope, and other test gear. Eventually, I built an entire electronics lab. Now, I guess I'm sort of an amp mechanic. I fix other electronics too, and this, well, this is my journey. I figured I'd share so others can learn too. I hope you like it, and just as a disclaimer, be sure to consult an expert before working with electricity. Hi, Dave the Amp Mechanic, coming to you from my amp lab in Boston, Massachusetts. And, you know, over the last year, I've accumulated a variety of pieces of equipment. Everything from amplifiers that I want to fix and turn around, even some old radios, to diagnostic gear that I really want to use in the lab in order to get my repairs done. Now, I really like sticking to vintage stuff to do my work. Uh, as you can see, I have vintage gear all around me. I have the oscilloscope over there, and uh, I have this old fan over here that I use to blow off solder smoke. All kinds of stuff like that here in the lab. I really like to do things old school. And I decided that I should slow down on fixing the amplifiers, uh, even though I have some friends who've dropped them off and said, hey, Dave, can you fix this? And I want to speed up on fixing some of the old vintage diagnostic gear that I have around here so I can actually use it to get my work done. And so then the next question was, well, of my diagnostic gear, what should I focus on first? For example, um, I have a couple different pieces of gear here. I have um, this Heath Kit signal tracer, right? This is the T4 signal tracer. I also have um, a Sprague Telomic T06. Telomic is the uh, is is the brand here. I think T O and the T06 is the T and the O in Telomic. I also have um, a capacitor checker, legendary IT11 Heathkit capacitor checker, and uh, even have the newer version of it, which is uh, over here. This is the uh, IT28. I have both of them, and uh, there's really not a whole lot of difference between them. This is the newer version, and uh, it's got, actually, I think this one's better looking than this one. So, uh, you know, if you think about the this device, this device, and this device, they all kind of do the same thing. They, they're, they're for checking capacitors. Although this one here has the gauge on the front. It's a little bit of a nicer looking piece of gear. And a lot of people think of this as the, the Cadillac of capacitor checkers. There's a good probability that once I decide uh, to fix these, this will be the one I keep, and then I'll sell these two. Now, I got each of these from the same guy for $50, and they're selling on eBay for somewhere in the neighborhood of $200, even when they're not working. So I'll use this to fund other purchases for the lab here. Um, and so eventually I'll be selling those. Another device that I have here to uh, give the once over, so to say, is this um, beautiful ICO 667 dynamic conductance uh, tube tester and uh, also a transistor tester. Now, um, I, the reason I bought this was because uh, this gentleman that is up in the online Tektronix uh, group, uh, the oscilloscope group, wrote an amazing paper on how to turn this 667 mutual conductance or dynamic conductance tube tester into a fixture for a Tektronix 577 curve tracer. Uh, and I happen to have one of those too, also in need of uh, a little bit of attention. Um, I searched high and low for both of those things because of the paper, because what the paper 
uh, teaches you how to do is how to turn this into a fixture for the curve tracer in a way that any tube that you can plug in to this uh, tube tester actually can also be profiled on the curve tracer. Now why would you do that? Well, what a curve tracer does is, is it, it, it profiles, it can be used to profile tubes in a way that you can match them. Plus you can also really get a good sense of how they perform across a range of voltages. Um, it, it's a great way to profile uh, your different tubes that you might use in guitar amplifiers and uh, tube radios. This is also a great tube tester in its own right. Um, it can be uh, used just to test tubes with its dynamic conductance capability. And by the way, when you're testing tubes, um, you have a choice of using one of these tube testers that does dynamic or mutual conductance, <clears throat> or a tube tester like this one, which really is just more of an emissions tester. It'll tell you if you have a short, it'll give you some idea of um, whether the tube works or not. Uh, this is a uh, B&K Dynajet model 606, uh, but it doesn't really test the tubes under the same conditions that, that you might have in an actual device like a guitar amplifier or tube radio. Um, whereas the mutual conductance and the uh, dynamic conductance testers actually will uh, throw the same sort of uh, voltage that you are um, subjecting the tube to in your device, they'll, they'll do that as a part of the test. And so uh, I'll probably sell that one because I really don't need it. Um, when you have this other m one that's like far more in industrial strength. Uh, so, um, uh, but those things, you know, are gonna come later because I really, uh, I don't need the tube tester as much as I need the signal tracer. This is the one I'm going to do next because uh, not only can it trace a signal through the circuit, um, for example, you know, uh, when the signal's going through a path in a guitar amplifier, you can uh, probe the circuit with this probe and you can hear the sound. That's compared to what you might do with an oscilloscope where you see the sound on the graticule on the screen of the oscilloscope. But it turns out that this thing does a whole bunch of other things. It's like it's actually like a little guitar amplifier uh, in some ways. Um, it can even inject a little bit of uh, DC circuit uh, signal, um, 100 volts, into a circuit to do a couple other diagnostic tests. So I got very excited when I realized that this thing not only can just trace a sig signal, it can actually uh, do some other diagnostics in a way that gets you probably um, more quickly to the uh, end of your repair journey with a given device. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to open this up and I'm also going to take a look at the schematic so we can get on with it. Okay, before we open it up and start looking at the guts, I thought we'd give it the once over on the outside, talk a little bit about what's going on on the front panel here, the controls, the connections, and also give the unit a little bit of a once over just to see what condition it's in, talk a little bit about this probe, and also look at the documentation to see just exactly all of the things that this Heathkit T4 signal tracer can do in terms of diagnostics on audio gear and radio gear. And uh, so let's get going. First of all, you can see it's in, in amazing condition for a 1960s class device. Uh, the front panel is very clean and uh, looks a little bit like these speaker terminals. One of them's a little bit bent. We can straighten that out, of course. And, and there's a little bit of a bend here in the front panel. Uh, I can straighten that out, I'm sure. But overall, an incredibly clean specimen, if you want to call it that. Uh, I can see some traces of uh, nicotine stains here. And one of the reasons that a lot of this gear from that era is uh, colored this way, the paint, is especially to hide these stains because so many of the men and women who used all of the different diagnostic gear for fixing electronics, oscilloscopes, signal generators, signal tracers, etc., they all smoked. And that's 
why a lot of this gear when you pick it up used also has a little bit of an interesting smell to it so this paint color and the other one that's more like a brownish color uh, hides those stains very well and what we'll do is as a part of rejuvenating this signal tracer is we'll be sure to clean it up some and get rid of that staining on the sides so let's go over the front panel here just so we have a really good sense of what it does or what it what it what it's sort of telling us it does by the the variety of controls here okay so let's take the signal tracer from top to bottom starting at the top here we have these two terminals banana jacks uh, they also have your typical um, you can like put a spade connection there there's even a a little bit of a hole through the terminal so you can just stick a wire through it and turn it and, and screw it down those are these are very useful uh, terminals uh, because they can be used in a variety of ways like I said including a banana jack which would go right in the front there and the uh, the purpose of these because they say SPKR underneath they're labeled that way um, they're obviously connected in some way shape or form to the speaker my guess is that you can do one of two things we'll figure out once we go through the documentation either a you can connect this device to an external speaker and take uh, and bypass this one or b you can use this speaker uh, as a test speaker when uh, trying to uh, test other devices by just connecting um, the output of those devices directly up to these terminals now obviously one issue with that would be you'd want to know whether this is a 4 ohm or an 18 ohm or a 16 ohm speaker because if you're connecting it to some other device to test that device you need to make sure that the output impedance of that device matches the uh, input impedance of the speaker uh, you don't want to have a mismatch there because you could have problems so we'll have to look at what the impedance of the speaker is my, my gut tells me is that this is probably a, a 4 ohm speaker and my reason for that is because m my sense from just looking at all the things this device can do the fact that it says RF on this probe is that this device is actually primarily designed to work with radios not necessarily guitar amplifiers and more than likely if you have the speaker here it's trying to pick up uh, it's, it's it's behaving as a substitute speaker uh, for a radio uh, and radios typically didn't have the big 8 ohm and 16 ohm speakers they had more like a little 4 ohm speaker like this one so we'll throw my digital multimeter on this particular speaker or on these connections if these connections are connected to the speaker to try to discover uh, whether this is a 4, 8, or 16 ohm speaker. So let's move on down. Of course, we have the speaker here, and uh, that's very useful with a signal tracer of this type because what you do with a signal tracer is you uh, basically look for signal at various locations along a signal path in an amplifier or a radio. So you basically take this probe and from the beginning to the end of the path, from the beginning where, you got, where you've got your input, uh, to the end, you, you touch different locations along the signal path, and if you have some signal there, hopefully you'll hear it through the speaker. Now, at the beginning of that path, the speaker is going to uh, need some gain control on it to pick up or uh, hear that signal. So if you imagine, for example, uh, at the very beginning of a guitar amplifier signal path, the signal is going to be very weak. The whole point of the amplifier is to amplify the signal and give you some volume on that. Uh, so at the beginning, when you're running a diagnostic and you're probing that, that very early part of the circuit, you're probably going to need a gain control so you can hear that signal. And so this gain control looks like it goes from 0 to 100, which is obviously a percentage. And uh, this would also be useful, for example, with a radio if, let's say, the very beginning of the, uh, where, where, where the antenna picks up the radio frequency and goes through the first uh, tuner, the capacitor, uh, it's tuning into a specific frequency, that there's been no amplification provided at that point, and the signal's going to be incredibly weak. You're going to need some gain to, uh, to hear whether or not you're actually picking that signal up or not. Okay, next we come over here to this side, and we see the on-off switch, and, of course, 
to the extent that this has uh, offers some sort of amplification capability, a gain knob, uh, there's going to be some tubes and transformer in here, and so uh, obviously this is going to activate the unit. But if this speaker can also be used uh, as a substitute speaker all by itself without any of the other electronics working, this will come in handy because you want the device to be in the off position. Uh, again, we're going to have to figure out whether that's one of the things that this does. Uh, you've got uh, another off-on switch here, uh, and it says on the underneath of it, it has the label SPKR, just, just like the labels underneath these two terminals. And uh, more than likely, uh, what this does is it just deactivates the speaker. Um, if, for example, you, these are for connecting to an external speaker, then this would probably take this speaker out of circuit because you'd want to do that to make sure that your circuit impedance is correct. You don't want to have two speakers just kind of wired into a circuit that way. So um, this probably takes it out of, out of circuit. Also, if let's say you've got an extreme amount of static or hum or noise and you're like, okay, I don't even want to hear that. I just want to see what's going on with the circuit, uh, then you turn the speaker off and you might focus your attention on this magic eye tube. Now this kind of gets into, you know, what does this device do? Uh, it's, it's very much the same thing as oscilloscope. It's, it's just the audio version of an oscilloscope, right? You use an oscilloscope, you connect it up to some part of your signal path and you visualize the signal on the screen of the oscilloscope. Uh, but with a signal tracer, what you're doing is you're listening to that signal. But what this does is it provides a little bit of a crude way to visualize it too, and that's uh, on this magic eye tube. And uh, you know, essentially what a magic eye tube is, it's just basically your know, typical cathode ray tube that's responding to a signal that's going through here uh, in a very kind of uh, analog way. You know, it's got a little um, uh, light that kind of opens and closes in a way that you can get some idea of whether you've got signal or not and whether that signal is changing or it's just constant. The uh, next button down or switch is a noise switch and we'll have to figure out what that does but um, I read somewhere that this probe, with this probe you can actually apply uh, some amount of DC to an existing circuit and that may be to start to isolate isolate where in the circuit there's a problem and the, uh, the to be able to inject DC into a circuit maybe some noise as well uh, would help you to do that so we'll have to figure out what you know that's what this this function is for but I suspect that's what it is and of course when you do something like that the device under test, whether it's a guitar amplifier or radio, has to be off because now you're injecting, you're, 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 you're essentially applying power from an external device. It's kind of like using an external DC power supply. You've got the magic eye tube down here to visualize what your signal is doing. Uh, then you've got this jack here, which uh, it, in all of the other images that I've seen on the internet of this Heathkit uh, T4 signal tracer, they don't have this. So my guess is, is that uh, this was added by one of the owners along the way. Now, why did they add this? Add this? Normally, if you look at all the images that are out there, the probe is hardwired through this location. There's a strain relief on, on the cable, and uh, the probe is just sort of hanging off this device. And th that's just would be problematic for a couple reasons. One is, then the only way you can probe a, a device under test is with this probe. And maybe that's not what you want to do. Maybe you want to, you want to connect other types of probes to it. Maybe like the probes that you use on an oscilloscope, or maybe, who, who knows. Uh, also, storing it. You want to be able to kind of store it so the cable's not hanging off of it. You maybe want to put the, cab the, the probe on top like that. Uh, it's, it's difficult to store this very neatly when you've got a big thing like this hanging off. So, um, you know, my guess is, is that 
whoever owned this along the way said, hey, you know what, we're gonna disconnect the hardwired probe from the device, put a jack in, and then put the matching side on, on the probe wire, and then I can just plug this in and also have other, other, other types of probes that I can plug in here. Now, as you can see, I don't have the matching part of the probe here, and why is that? Well, when I acquired the signal tracer, it didn't come with a probe. It just came like this, and uh, I acquired the probe separately. I, I had to go out and search for the probe, and it had no connection on it, and that's okay. I'll figure out what I'm gonna do. My gut tells me that I'm going to probably uh, add um, uh, a BNC connector like this as opposed to a quarter inch jack. That way I can uh, definitely connect up a variety of probe types, like an oscilloscope probe or this probe, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just fix all, the, or just make basic alligator clips. Um, this thing, I could just plug that in and then uh, add, you know, have probes that go on with the banana jacks. So um, this will probably give me the ultimate flexibility and not to mention some great shielding um, because you'd want that shielding when uh, uh, using this device since it, particularly at the very low gain stages of a radio or a guitar amplifier you have to crank the gain up you want to minimize the uh, any noise that would uh, be introduced through um, induction from uh, ambient frequencies that are in the air for example you know AC power lastly and um, by the way uh, you probably can hear water running and that's because my lab is in the basement here. We're a family of five people and uh, everybody's using the, the sinks and the showers and stuff. So uh, it's just one of those, uh, you know, collateral damage that I have to take when I'm shooting these videos. Oh well. Um, so I apologize for that little bit of extra sound there in the background. Lastly, if we go down to this, these three terminals here, uh, we've got one that says CT, obviously above it it says output transformer, so like a little bit of a giveaway. Uh, you have one that says CT, you have another one that says B+, plus, and another one that's uh, hard to see, see if we can get the light on it there, it says P. Now that is a little bit of a giveaway, right? This is more than likely the center tap of the output transformer that's in here. So the implication is, is that I can use the output transformer in this device as, uh, you know, a substitute output transformer for some other device. And so it's kind of cool to have an output transformer kind of handy like that. I, I'm just assuming that's what it's for. And then down here, this is telling you, okay, this is the B plus side of that transformer. And uh, the P over here, I'm gonna turn it again so you can see in the light. Uh, that just probably stands for, you know, we're, we're looking at the primary side, uh, the, um, the other end of the winding from the B plus. And so that's what uh, these different terminals are for. So we'll have to figure out uh, why or, or what the designers intended these these terminals for but more than likely again to use this output transformer uh, with um, with some other external device that where you wanted to test uh, or take s substitute this output transformer for the one that's in that device well I'm just guessing here okay so that's the whole front panel let's talk a little bit about this probe this probe is starting to uh, you know if you look at it it kind of gives away the fact that this is really um, primarily designed and intended for looking at uh, radios. This is really built around that function and the reason is, is if you look at this it's got uh, one direction it's got well hey let's move this switch in this direction just for audio for testing audio and move it in this direction if you're looking for radio frequency uh, and in order to sort of understand why that's so important why this probe is looks like a a missile um, obviously it's got something on the inside uh, we should talk a little bit about the typical design of a radio and uh, why this probe design 
would be especially useful given how radios are designed. So let's move over to a schematic of your typical radio, especially radios from this era, and uh, talk a little bit about how they work and you'll get a better understanding of why this thing was really built uh, for signal tracing on radios, but it also works on regular amplifiers like guitar amplifiers. Okay, so to better understand how a Heathkit signal tracer works, you also should understand the basic operation of a radio circuit. And this is why I say the signal tracer was really originally designed mostly with testing radios and also televisions in mind, uh, because there are some interesting design features to your typical radio circuit that apply very well to the signal tracer. So uh, this is a block diagram of what's called a super heterodyne receiver or radio. Uh, now, I know there's going to be people who leave comments who say, I screwed this up, I didn't explain it correctly, but I'm looking to just give you a general rundown of how a super heterodyne radio works. Now, super stands for supersonic. That means it uses frequencies in a range that the human ear cannot hear. Uh, hetero means mixed, as opposed to homo, which means uh, like homogenous, means a single thing. And then uh, dyne means uh, power. So super heterodyne kind of means supersonic uh, mixed power. And as you can see in the middle of the uh, block diagram here or over to the left, we have this circle that's called the mixer. So we'll talk a little bit about that. That's where the uh, hetero comes from. So let's talk about how uh, your basic radio circuit works. Now, super heterodyne radios were very popular in the mid 80s and pretty much all radios work off this very basic principle. So uh, this will be just helpful in understanding how radios work. Way over on the left here, things start off with the metal antenna that collects the signal from the sky. So let's say you know, you're know you tuning into uh, an AM frequency. Let's say that uh, you want to get the frequency 1460 on your radio. Uh, the metal antenna actually is up there in the air uh, and it's collecting every frequency that's floating around us. In fact, that's a really good principle to know anyway because when you think about the guitar amplifier hum or guitar hum, uh, the hum often comes from the fact that the wires that are in your guitar amplifier or the wires that are in your pickups of your guitar, they're just like antennas and they're picking up whatever frequencies are floating around unless you do something to mitigate that. And so these antennas, this antenna here is picking up all the frequencies that are in their air around you and in the case of uh, the um, AM radio frequency range, you're talking somewhere around 500 all the way up to 1600, right? Uh, all of those frequencies are being detected or picked up by the metal antenna, and that uh, those frequencies are exciting the, re the electrons that are in the metal antenna. Now, those electrons come down this path here, um, and right before the RF amplifier, RF stands for radio frequency, there's usually a tuning coil. And the tuning coil essentially is what narrows the frequency that's going to be passed through the circuit, passed on into the circuit, down to one frequency. And I won't get into how tuning coils work, just you have to sort of trust me that there's usually a tuning coil right about this point of the circuit. Now, before I go on into the radio frequency amplifier, I want to talk a little bit about the local oscillator because the operation of this tuning coil affects the operation of this local oscillator. Now the way, uh, in, in, if you ever see some sort of explanation of radios, you'll see RF and LO, RF standing for radio frequency, LO standing for local oscillator. Now when you, the uh, owner of a radio changes the tuning of the radio to tune into a specific frequency, that dial is usually impacting both the, uh, the tuning coil that's right here ahead of the RF amplifier, as well as the tuning coil that's on this local oscillator at the same exact time. Now, why would you do that? Okay, well, 
uh, the, the way it's designed is that the local oscillator is always starting at an offset from the RF amplifier, or I'm sorry, from the, uh, the tuning, uh, the, the uh, tuner that's just ahead of the RF amplifier by 455 kilohertz. So whatever, uh, whatever you're tuning the radio to, the local oscillator will be tuned to something that's about 455 uh, kilohertz less. So let's say you're tuning the radio to the frequency 1460 on your AM dial. Well, the local oscillator is tuned to the frequency 1005. That's just 1460 minus 455, right? Well, why does it do that? Okay, that's where this gets really interesting. Because when it shows up in the mixer, there's going to be a little math that's done by whatever the mixer is built on. It could be built on a vacuum tube or it can be built on a diode. Just before the signal that's coming from the antenna, the tuned signal, let's say it's 1460, comes into the mixer, it, uh, it goes through an RF amplifier. Okay, so right about here, in between the tuner and the RF amplifier might be where you first apply the signal tracer's probe. And when you apply the probe there, what you're looking for is some signal, something from that station 1460, and hopefully it's a pretty strong station that's, that's, uh, that's around you. It could be any station, but I'm just using 1460 as the example. This is why it has a gain knob on it. Because at this point, the signal is going to be very, very weak. And you need the gain knob to really crank up the volume on the signal tracer to try to hear the signal through your speaker at this moment in the circuit. Once it goes through the RF amplifier and you get onto the other side of the RF amplifier, then the signal will be amplified so that you don't actually need to turn the gain up all the way. You will still need to turn the gain up, but just not all the way, and you may have an easier time hearing the signal. So you can imagine that if you have a signal tracer, you're poking along here in the circuit uh, at different locations, and each at each location, you may have a little more gain or uh, you know an isolated signal, whatever it may be, that's what, what uh, what this is really good at doing. So um, you've got all the frequencies coming in here. They come up to the uh, the tuner the tuner coil. Um, you narrow it down to let's say 1460. It goes through the RF amplifier, gets amplified, and it comes into the mixer at the frequency of 1460. From the local oscillator, you're oscillating another frequency of 1005. 1460 minus 455. This mixer is really kind of like an invention, an amazing invention, if you think about it. It really changed everything. Uh, the way this works is the mixer will then pass on a whole variety of frequencies uh, to the IF amplifier and filter. Now, IF, that stands for intermediate frequency. And the intermediate frequency at this point is the frequency that the radio is going to deal with all the way up until the uh, audio amplifier. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, when these two frequencies come in here are in, and are mixed at the mixer, the mixer actually kind of does a little bit of math. And what the mixer does is it passes on a couple more, uh, like about four frequencies here. One of them will be the original frequency. One of them will be the local oscillator frequency. One of them will be the uh, the frequency, the difference between the two frequencies, and one of them will be the product of the two frequencies. Now, why is this uh, why is this so important? Well, if it passes on the difference between these two frequencies, remember I said that the local oscillator is always working at a 455 kilohertz offset from the whatever frequency is working here. It's essentially one dial moving the two the, the two tuners, and it's just that the from a hardware perspective, the physical tuner is always just already um, automatically preset to being 455 kilohertz different. When it gets here and does the math, it passes on, like I said, it, it, the, the, if this was a vacuum tube, it's usually what's called a hexode. And when it passes, when the hexode passes on those frequencies, one of the frequencies it's passing on 
is, like I said, the difference. So it takes 1460 minus, mi minus 1005, so the, the difference between these two, and what ends up over here is a 455 kilohertz signal. All four of the signals being passed on to the intermediate frequency amplifier are carrying uh, the whatever the audio was on the uh, um, that, that uh, whatever the whatever the audio was on the signal that was passed out of the RF amplifier. So whereas before you had one signal coming into the mixer with that audio in it, now you have four uh, signals coming out of the mixer with that audio in it. One of them being the 455 uh, uh, kilohertz frequency. And what's really cool about that is, you know, 455 is pretty much below the operating spectrum of AM, so you don't have to worry about anything else needing that frequency. And from this point forward, if you've ever aligned a radio, you'll know that you're basically tuning uh, the, um, the radio's uh, IF components into the 455, or you're optimizing the tuning of their tuning to the 455 kilohertz band. And the reason for that is because now you're going to really zero in on that intermediate frequency uh, to, um, to uh, isolate the signal, take the noise out of the signal, amplify it, and pass it on eventually to the audio amplifier part of the radio. And so you can imagine that once uh, the, the, uh, the signal has come through the mixer, you can apply the probe here and you can, uh, you can hear uh, the audio there. And then um, we can probe uh, after this stage, and then after this stage, and then after this stage, and so on. And so if you think about the, the real radio components of this entire um, uh, uh, path, signal path, uh, it goes all the way from the antenna up to the demodulator, right? And uh, sometimes they call uh, the demodulator the detector as well. And so, the de all through this this um, the circuit, this is really the radio part of the circuit. This is what sets a radio apart from a guitar amplifier. It has all these other components here that the guitar amplifier doesn't have, right? But over here is the audio amplifier. So it comes through the the signal, the radio signal comes through this whole circuit. We're still at four hundred and fifty five kilohertz over here. And by the way, when it says filter, what it's doing here is it's doing the same things that happen in a guitar amplifier. You're basically uh, filtering off all the noise uh, and, and getting a really clean uh, radio signal. So you're cleaning up the radio signal, the 455 kilohertz radio signal. The demodulator is where uh, it unpacks the audio from the radio signal. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into how uh, audio waves are carried over radio waves, but suffice to say that um, wherever the signal is being transmitted from the radio station, they have something called a modulator that takes the audio and uh, puts it inside of a, a radio wave. And then by the time it gets over here to the demodulator in a radio, the reverse process is happening. Now, one of the things about the probe in, and this is a very important aspect of the probe in the uh, for the T4 signal um, tracer is that uh, it has a demodulator in it as well. And so the reason it can pick up the audio all along the way here um, out of the circuit is because the probe has a demodulator in it. And so when, uh, because in order to hear the sound, you need something to demodulate it. And so that's why there's a switch on the probe uh, for RF and audio. You keep it in the RF mode because you're telling the probe, hey, use the demodulator inside of me to pick up the audio from the radio signal that's coming through a radio circuit. And again, that's why I get into the, uh, the, the origins of the T4 signal tracer being more for radios than they are for guitar amplifiers. And uh, also TVs, by the way. So uh, once the radio does the demodulation, and now you have nothing but an audio signal right at this point, that is the point at which you would switch the uh, the 
probe into the audio detection mode and start probing just for audio, right? And then, of course, here you get into this little uh, purplish pink triangle, and this is the audio amplifier. This is the part of the radio that is essentially the same as a guitar amplifier. Now, that may be carrying things away a little bit, uh, because a guitar amplifier usually has a lot more going on than the simple amplification that's happening in a radio, but you get the idea. From the antenna all the way up to the demodulator is mostly the radio. Then uh, over here, you've got the audio amplifier, which is kind of like the guitar amplifier. And the same sort of uh, diagnostics that you might run on the audio amplification section of a radio um, are pretty much the same as the diagnostics that you would run on the audio amplification uh, components of guitar amplifier. It's pretty much the same thing. You've got the speaker as the final output. So, you know, you're going to have all the same sort of components, vacuum tube, providing gain to the audio signal, multiple vacuum tubes, maybe, depending on the radio, you're going to have a trans an output transformer and so on. So this pretty much explains, um, in, in layman's terms, uh, you know, the operation, the, 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 the path of the signal that takes through, through a radio in a way that uh, you can better understand uh, exactly how a signal tracer might be effective in isolating a problem in a circuit like this. Again, you're just you know, moving the probe along and testing all of these different uh, uh, locations in the circuit to see what's going on with the signal. If, for example, you're picking up a signal way over here just after the tuning coil uh, and suddenly it's gone over here, then you would know that uh, something went wrong before it, like for example, the, the, the mixer tube may be bad. Um, if let's say uh, you've got um, uh, a weak signal here and uh, no gain on that signal right over here, then uh, you would know that maybe something was wrong with your tuning coil or maybe uh, your radio frequency amplifier. So you start getting an idea of how the signal tracer can be used to really isolate where the problem might exist inside of a radio. So now let's go back to the signal tracer and talk a little bit about its features and functions um, so you get a better idea of how those features and functions can be applied to this circuit as well as to uh, an audio amplifier. Helicopter action there for you, coming to you from the local hospital. For those of you who love to watch aircraft take off and land, I certainly hope whoever it dropped off is okay. Okay, turning to the documentation and the introduction, we can see that the Heathkit Model T4 signal tracer uh, has a list of things it can do. Of course, the, one of the first ones of them is the high gain position for direct signal tracing in RF uh, radio frequencies uh, or IF intermediate frequency circuits. So my assumption here is, is that when they say high gain, what they're referring to is that uh, you can crank the gain up uh, to hear whatever is being uh, demodulated through the probe. And the same is true uh, for audio circuits. So in either case, if you have a very weak signal, you can uh, use the gain knob to uh, really crank up the signal so you can uh, discern whether or not what you're looking for is actually there in the signal. And uh, they're distinguishing between audio and the uh, radio circuits, I think mainly because the uh, 
there's a crystal inside the the probe uh, that will demodulate a radio signal and uh, then also uh, you can move the switch from audio to radio frequency on the, on the probe and uh, you can switch between the two modes on the probe itself. And of course, that's what it says in the third item there. There's a convenient RF or audio switch on the probe body. So you're basically either switching um, the, the crystal into the circuit or out of the circuit, uh, and that basically decides uh, determines whether or not you need to demodulate uh, the signal. Now, what that means is, is that uh, in the radio world, when they send... Uh, audio across a radio frequency, um, they first have to modulate that audio onto the frequency, and then on the other end, where a receiver is, for example, a radio, you have to demodulate it. So it's 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 kind of the equivalent of taking the signal, putting it in a package, sending it across the air, and then uh, taking it out of the package on the other side. Now, you have different forms of modulation. There's AM, which stands for amplitude modulation, and FM, which stands for frequency modulation. We'll get into the specifics of them right now. Uh, but uh, suffice to say that uh, you're using, like for example, an AM mo uh, amplitude modulation, you're essentially using uh, the amplitude of the signal uh, to create um, um, the modulation that's going out um, over some particular frequency. So uh, then the fourth item here says the tracer may be used for AM, FM, and TV circuit exploration. Uh, actually, uh, they're leaving out uh, amplifier circuit exploration as well, but essentially the principles are the same. Once you have signals coming in, uh, you know, radio frequency signals uh, coming in across the air and you're demodulating them, it will work for most radios. Uh, and also uh, televisions, there, there's really not a significant difference between a TV and a radio uh, at the end of the day, and then of course audio circuits as well. The visual signal indicator, uh, I'm going to have to assume that they're referring to the magic eye tube, and uh, the magic eye tube will uh, fluctuate uh, depending on the signal, um, and that will give you some visual indication as to whether or not there's a signal coming through the probe. Uh, a noise locator circuit. Now, I, I dug a little bit deeper into the documentation to get a better understanding of how this works. And essentially, uh, what it will do if you, uh, you, you can essentially switch on uh, roughly a, a 100 volt, um, uh, a 100 volt um, signal in, into the probe, uh, it'll basically inject 100 volts uh, at that particular location in the circuit, wherever you're probing. And then what you do is you, uh, you, you clip the uh, alligator clip uh, of the ground lead to some other part of the circuit. And essentially what it's doing is it's trying to uh, determine if there's a problem between the point at which you clip the alligator clip and where you're connecting the the probe. And based on what I could read is if, if, it, if it's supposed to work, if, if the circuit's good, you're going to hear a very noticeable loud click, like a noise, I guess. And, and that essentially tells you that, hey, um, uh, you know, you've got a good clean circuit here. I think that the click, if it's just a big like kind of click or a pop, it's almost sort of like that click or pop that you may sometimes notice when you complete a circuit. Um, even like when you are plugging a plug into the wall and like you just make sort of that contact where you didn't put it in so fast and you heard a noise. I, I kind of think that's what it is. We'll test it out, of course. We'll try to see uh, what they actually mean. But um, it's kind of a, an unusual feature. And, and I, I suspect that if there's a problem between where you've got the ground lead connected and where you're touching with the probe, that 
you'll you may hear some other noise, some hum, some artifacts, something that indicates it's not a totally clean circuit. So we'll try to give this a try. Um, don't know if I'll actually um, confirm the the way it works. The documentation is a little sketchy when it comes to explaining this feature, but uh, we'll, we'll give it a shot. A utility amplifier for checking record changers, tuners, etc. Now, if you think about what they're saying is, is hey, there are a bunch of devices that you may own, uh, record changers, uh, radio tuners, uh, things that don't have their own ability to amplify. And so what we're talking about here is uh, the fact that the signal tracer actually has a small amplifier in it that will uh, be able to amplify the signal coming from those devices. Now, I think the assumption is, is that those devices are probably operating at line level, uh, as many uh, uh, consumer devices of that nature do, and uh, that this will give you some amplification of that signal so you can check to see if it's working. And so the same sort of principle will probably work for other unamplified things like microphones, um, musical instruments, pickups, etc. All of these things have, um, they don't have their own form of amplification. Speakers, uh, now this is where I believe, um, you know, we'll get into it. If you, um, you can connect uh, substitute speakers to the speaker terminals uh, and you can, uh, and you can uh, throw the speaker switch in a way that will uh, take the internal speaker out of circuit and put the other ones in circuit. Uh, you may want to double check the impedance of whatever speakers you're clipping in to make sure that uh, it's sufficient for um, uh, in, in the event that you're relying on an external amplifier. I don't know. We'll have to kind of play around with that feature. Then also, um, well, that's the substitution speaker and using the output transformer. So you could, in fact, just use the um, internal uh, transformer for outputting uh, to your substitution speaker. And, uh, and then finally, output level indicator. And again, my, my guess is, is that what we're talking about here is uh, the magic eye tube and the ability to um, respond also to an audio circuit. I think the, the previous um, visual signal indicator may have been referring to radio frequency. So it's sort of like the same, the same capability, the same magic eye tube uh, responding to essentially two different signals in the circuit. You know, one's a radio frequency signal, the other one's an audio signal. Th this is where I sometimes laugh at the documentation uh, because sometimes they'll, they'll list things in different language to make it sound like there's a longer list of features than there really is. But uh, we'll give it a shot. So uh, let me go see uh, what my dog is barking about upstairs. Hopefully there's nobody at the front door. And then we'll come back and we'll, we'll uh, take the signal tracer apart, uh, open it up, and uh, inspect its interior, and uh, make some decisions about what uh, we'll do of anything in the way of repairs or modifications, throw it on the Variac, etc. Okay, well, we have the signal tracer here on the bench with the probe. Um, the ground clip is disconnected from the probe. We're going to have to fix that as well. And obviously, as I said earlier, we have to reconnect this probe uh, in some way to the unit. And I'm thinking maybe put like a little uh, BNC cable connector here so that uh, makes it easier to connect to other probes. So uh, this unit's been off for a while. I mean, I don't think I've turned it on once since I received it, so I'm not too concerned about capacitors inside holding their charge or anything like that. So let's go ahead and, uh, and open it up. And uh, the first thing we see here is that we've got some electrical tape that's holding the wire together. And my gut tells me from looking at it that this, this back piece comes off and then, and then, uh, well, maybe not. It's hard to tell. At the very bare minimum, we'll unscrew that. But then, if this back piece comes off here, then um, the cord may have to pass through this hole. 
and so I have to uh, take this electrical tape off the cord. So let's just do that first. There we go. Years of electrical tape. It's, we might have to replace this wire. It's kind of gooky. Also a little brittle. Okay. So let's go ahead and looks like we're missing one screw right there. So from the get-go, we've got a little bit of an issue. We'll have to replace that one screw. So we're going to use my uh, trusty uh, screwdriver, uh, cordless screwdriver here. And uh, just a reminder that almost all of my gear uh, here in the lab, I bought on some used marketplace, Craigslist, garage sale, whatever. I got this at a garage sale for, I think, two or three bucks. And that's how I got to where I am with all my gear is I really just, uh, okay, that's not going to fit that little head, so I'm going to have to pull a smaller screwdriver out. That's how I got all of my gear, and uh, I would strongly recommend you do the same if you're patient. Pretty much everything you'll need will show up at some point or another, and uh, you'll be able to acquire and accumulate the right tools for for very little money. Let's see, how's this one right here? Does this fit? Yeah, that fits there. So, use my magnetic screwdriver. Take this guy out of here. Oh yeah, it's loosening up. You can see that right there, it's loosening up. So that's clearly the guy. If there was one on the other side, would do that one too. It's almost falling away at this point. There we go. And one of the things we do with uh, all the repairs here in the amp lab is I use old pill bottles to save the screws so they don't get lost. So we'll go ahead and uh, now let's turn this around here. See how that just came right off. There we go. And look at that. It's pretty inside. Oh, it looks like looks like they were using some electrical tape for some reason. Uh, looks like it was there to secure the magic eye tube. So it's a little bit of a kludge. Not sure that's the best. Not sure that's the best fix for something like that because um, obviously the tube's going to get warm. Uh, maybe oh, maybe they just did it to secure the eye tube when uh, when it was being transported. That could be that could be what it is. But um, it's very clean inside, uh, almost untouched. We've got the, the two tubes here. There's the uh, Sylvania tube. We'll pop this out and see what we got here. There we go. Some gook on the tube. Okay. And the pins are bent. I don't know if we can see the pins are, are bent there. Um, but we'll, we'll deal with that problem later. Well, let's not put it back in. We'll just leave it out for now. This is the uh, the 12 AX7. I forget which. Uh, this is a 12 CA5. That's what this is. So we have two tubes, and uh, obviously the 12 AX7 is is kind of like a little preamp tube there. And uh, let's see. 
looks pretty good. The the you can see that the the, um, the output transformer is mounted roughly at like ninety degrees to the uh, um, to the power transformer, and that of course is to minimize any uh, inductance between the two of them which in turn will minimize hum, so that's good. And there's also this metal, almost like a shield in between them, this additional shielding, so sufficient shielding there. Uh, so the next thing we'll do is, now that she's opened up, we'll get it on the Variac and we'll just power it up to see oh no we, we can't do that yet we're gonna have to deal with the probe issue first so let's uh... we're gonna have to remove the probe I can just get that off with my my finger Okay. All right. So we can see in there really well, but trying to, try to close in somewhat on that. see that the shield of the probe is connected basically to a ground lug that's on this piece way back in there. Get one of my chopsticks here. So it's way back in there. I don't know if we can see it or not. And then the other end of the probe connects up in here, right there. So we're going to have to get in there and maybe bring a new lead out of some sort that deals with that probe and I'm gonna have to get I don't even have a BNC connector a spare one so uh, I'm gonna have to actually order one and then we'll come back and we'll get the probe up to snuff and then we'll get it on the Variac Alrighty, so here we are with the Heathkit T4 signal tracer opened up a bit more and I'm going to go over the plan with you. Uh, so far, in terms of opening up a bit more, I took the old uh, quarter inch jack that was uh, mounted right about here uh, out of the signal tracer and I disconnected the, uh, the stretch of coaxial cable that went from the back of it uh, over into uh, the lug back in here. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And uh, I also uh, took the uh, the uh, eye tube out. I disconnected it from its socket, which is right here. And there was also uh, the eye socket was uh, the eye tube was mounted to a very nice um, little shield that was connected to these two points right here. And I removed that shield as well. So. Uh, we can get at the internals a little bit better. Now what's the plan? As I mentioned earlier, the plan is uh, we got rid of that quarter inch jack and we're going to replace it with a, a BNC jack. And here is that BNC jack right here. And uh, the way that that's going to go through the where the quarter inch jack was, right there. Okay, And we'll connect a little piece of coaxial cable that where the old coax was, we're going to connect up this coax here, 
uh, to the back of this BNC connector, and it's going to go into uh, onto these onto this uh, terminal strip back here, and we'll, we'll get in close and talk about that in a second. Uh, then uh, the other piece of the plan is to uh, make sure we use the correct um, a BN, uh, I'm sorry, the, the correct coaxial cable. So I noted that uh, on the probe, the probe has um, RG58 AU cable. Uh, AU means it's the 50 ohm coaxial cable and uh, the A part means it's got a stranded core, makes it a little more flexible. Uh, but if you look at the directions for the signal tracer, it actually calls for 58U, which is the unstranded core. So what I did was I acquired some uh, pre-made, uh, pre-built RG58U cable with BNC connectors on it. That's this right here. Hopefully you can see that. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically hack that to use in, in this application. And what I mean by that is that uh, we'll take the probe, and, and again, here's the probe. Get that in, in the picture here. Here's the probe. And this, is this, this here is a stretch of RG58AU that's on the probe. What we'll do is we'll chop one end of, the, of, the, uh, of this cable off here, this RG58U, and we will put the other end into the probe. We'll, we'll just replace the, uh, the existing coaxial cable coming off the probe with this coaxial cable. And then because uh, a BNC connector is already on one end, it'll just be able to connect right up here to the BNC connector that we install onto the, uh, onto the signal tracer. And that will give us a nice consistent 50 ohm path all the way from the uh, terminal strip that's inside here all the way out to the end of the probe, and that's what we really want because that's what the documentation calls for. I'd like to get in a little closer here, and hopefully this will work out because we've got the new camera. So let's get in real tight here, and I'm gonna have to dip the, uh, the camera down just a tad. Yep, there we go. So we can really see the insides. And let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here. So. Uh, while we've got this thing opened, uh, we should probably renovate some of the uh, items on the inside. If we look very closely, and um, again, I hope with the new camera we can get a good autofocus here going, but if we look very closely, there goes my phone, just dropped it on the floor, here's the terminal strip that we're connecting to, and the, uh, the, the, the core of the coaxial connects to the bottom lug on the strip and the uh, the shield connects to the top lug and I'm okay with that that's that would be the plan so we'll make a very little tiny stretch of coaxial cable that goes from here to the BNC connector and the reason we want to use the coax again is because we want to have a good solid 50 ohm connection in terms of its impedance all the way from this terminal strip right out to the end of the probe. So we want to use the 50 ohm coaxial cable as much as we can. And also that cable is going to be shielded and you've got this big honking transformer here and uh, that'll help shield the path of the signal going through that coaxial cable. While we're in here, and, and uh, I'm just going to kind of move this a little bit maybe so you can get a good view in there. While we're in here, let's see if we can get the light up even closer. I'm going to have to replace a couple components. One of them is this 400 volt 0.01 microfarad uh, uh, capacitor. Pretty old capacitor, as you can tell, one of the old, probably old, old oil caps. And it's, uh, I, I gave it a test and even, I tested it in circuit. I know that's not the best thing to do, but there's actually zero uh, uh, continuity going from one end to the other. This capacitor is completely fried. Um, the other thing, and I don't know if we can see it up close here, but you've got this particular resistor. That's a 68K ohm resistor right there. And uh, it looks like it's got a little bit of heat stress on it. Um, might be from 
soldering. I'm not sure. It may have been me, quite frankly. I, I'm not sure. But um, what we're going to do is we'll replace that one resistor just because of the little bit of heat stress that you can see on it. I mean, it may mean it may be nothing, but as long as we're in here and uh, we don't want to have to come back in here later again to fix it all up, why not get in there and fix that? Now, one thing I was noticing was is that whoever put this together, and you have to remember these were consumer kits, whoever put it together um, didn't leave a whole lot of space going from uh, this side of the resistor into this lug. So maybe we'll uh, open it up a little bit just so that it's easier to maintain in the future. So that's the plan. Uh, we'll get uh, the um, we'll get it all put together. Get the new resistor in there. Uh, also, um, we'll have uh, 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 the electrolytic capacitor is going to have to be replaced, and that is. Let's see if I can get up here a little bit closer. There we go. That this is the bottom of the current uh, electrolytic can that's um, that that's on this device. So it's a three-section electrolytic capacitor. Uh, two of the sections are at 50 picofarads at 150 volts. And, I'm sorry, 50 uh, 50 microfarads at 150 volts, and then the other section is 20 microfarads at 25 volts, and that particular capacity, that can, I, I did a lot of searching all over and I couldn't find the replacement can. So what I'm going to have to do is sort of fabricate a can that will go on the other side here, uh, up on the back side here, and I'll try to zoom out some now so we can see. So on the back side here, here's the, I'm actually banging the can right now with a chopstick. So we'll go uh, we'll fabricate like an electrolytic capacitor almost like a can that goes on this side that pokes through the bottom and comes out this side and takes the place of the uh, existing uh, um, uh, electrolytic three section electrolytic capacitor and so that means that we'll have to take all these connections off right here and uh, and then resolder them onto the new capacitor so a lot to keep track of because we don't want to we we'll try to do this as uh, we, with a minimal, as minimal a disturbance as possible to these existing connections because they're all pretty good. Um, but uh, it's inevitable that we'll have to desolder some things and then resolder them. So, you know, one thing I'll of course be doing is taking a good close photograph, even though we have the video here, of of that electrolytic, so that um, when it comes time to put it back together, I put it back together exactly the same way it was. So when we come back, uh, you'll have we'll have a new uh, uh, capacitor. Let's kind of get back down again uh, below here. I'm getting some reflection on the light. Let's, uh, but let's get down underneath there again one more time. Yeah. There we go. So when we come back, um, that resistor will be replaced. This capacitor will be replaced, and uh, um, hopefully we'll even have the electrolytics up there. So we'll be close to, and then we'll also have that little piece of coax cutting from this terminal strip down to the BNC connector in here. So a lot of it will be back together. Okay, so here we are uh, midway through the renovation. And the first thing I want to point out is we've got this new BNC jack located right over here. So we replaced that old uh, quarter inch jack with this one. And what that'll do is that'll help uh, solidify the connection. And then I can make all kinds of probes that I want to attach this using your basic uh, BNC connector. So we've got the, the jack installed. Now let's turn this over so you can see what's going on on the back. On the back, pull this up here and let me turn it a little bit to the side and zero in some on what we've got going on here. Okay. So you can see that there's a terminal strip right here. 
Here's the back of the BNC plug. And I've created a nice, really nice looking stretch of coaxial cable that goes from the terminal strip to the back of the BNC. Um, I don't know if you can see really closely, but there's the shielding coming off and it's uh, soldered to the, to the ground side. And then here's the center conductor. I've also replaced the 68K resistor that was back in there that looked like it might have been damaged. I might have even have been the one to damage it with my soldering iron. I'm going to pick this up just a little bit and you can probably see the new capacitor in there. Since I'm in here, I decided to replace the, uh, the old Sangamo cap. This one is a much newer cap, so it's a lot smaller. So uh, that work's been done. And let's see, what else am I going to do here? Well, uh, up here, as you can pull this uh, out of the way, I, I tested all the resistors. You can see there's a whole bunch of them around here. And this one is well out of spec. So I'm going to replace that resistor and that's not going to be too much of a big deal because I was already planning on replacing the three section can capacitor. This is the bottom of that capacitor. Those things don't tend to uh, last 40 years. So as long as I've got this open, I might as well replace it now. And uh, if we turn this over, we can see there's the can. And uh, one of the things about this, this can capacitor is that it's um, uh, the values on it are not values that I was able to find uh, a brand new capacitor to replace this multi-section capacitor. So you've got basically 50 microfarads with 150 volts or two, two sections conform to that and the other section is 22 microfarads at 25 volts. I couldn't find anything quite like that so using a uh, technique that I saw Terry at D Labs uh, show on one of his videos. I will take a uh, tube socket like this one and I will sit, uh, I'll, I'll put that in the hole where the can capacitor is coming through and then using these uh, holes here, I'll drill them out and I will put radial electrolytic capacitors, you know, they have the two wires coming out, uh, the two leads coming out one end uh, through the holes so, they, uh, so that the leads poke out on the other side and essentially fabricate uh, a capacitor that's roughly the same capability as this one, a multi-section capacitor that's roughly the same as this one. So that means then I only have to go out and buy uh, three electrolytic capacitors that uh, basically are the same or equally capable as each of the sections in this one. So uh, the only problem is, is that this one, which I uh, got from a ham fest, uh, turns out doesn't have the, the bracket that secures it to, to, the, uh, to this, this metal piece here. And you can see the, if you look real kind of closely there, you can see that there's the bracket right there. So um, when I ordered those capacitors, I actually ordered another one of these sockets that comes with the bracket, so it'll sit in there. Um, we'll see how it fits. I, I measured it with a micrometer, and I think it's all going to fit right. But if it doesn't, I can drill the hole out a little bit more. So uh, finally, uh, in addition to doing all this work, we'll move this back some here, and let's uh, zoom out some. Here we go. We've also got the uh, the probe work done. So remember I said I was going to update the probe and so this is the probe finished and basically what we have here is same as it was before. It's got the switch here and everything but uh, now it's got a, a BNC connector on the end of the cable so I can just basically secure, I don't know, just do it like that. I can secure that in like that. And the way I did that was I just took a, a cable that I uh, ordered and took the 
BNC off of one end. And then as you can see, I also fixed up the, the ground clip. So here's the, the ground clip probe, the ground clip part of the probe. And, and this is essentially inside here is just tied to the shield. So then I did a continuity test on everything. So I double checked that uh, if you touch the tip of the probe, it, uh, um, that signal uh, has, pure, has continuity all the way through into the signal tracer. And, and that worked out and the same was true of the ground clip. Ground clip checked out with my multimeter to show continuity from the clip all the way back inside to where uh, that lead runs to. So that's where we are right now. The next steps are to make that capacitor, to fabricate that one capacitor, and we'll get that done. And also to uh, fix that one resistor that um, needs to come out at the same time that the capacitor comes out. Once we have that work done, we'll get it all back together, get the tubes in, and we'll give it a whirl. We have several items here that uh, are in need of repair and that this signal tracer will come in very handy on. Okay, so uh, here we are looking uh, again at the signal tracer and I just wanted to point out some measurements. One of the things I wanted to do was measure all the resistors. I noted earlier that one of them was kind of out of spec. Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, I've got my um, multimeter here set to uh, measure resistance ohms and if you look at uh, the bands here on on the resistor you can you know get an idea of what the resistor is that's the code there right and so the question is is how close is this guy going to be to let's see if we can get that on there to 10,000 uh, ohm uh, kilo ohms or 10, 10 kilo ohms 10,000 ohms and as you can see it's coming in at about 10.66. Let me just put the backlight on in case you can't see that one more time. Let's see, get it down there. There we go. It's coming in right around 10.6, 10.7. And uh, in this particular example, <clears throat> we're looking at a gold band. So with the, uh, with the gold band, it's basically indicating that it's supposed to be within 5%. So if you think about what's 5%, that's going to be about 500 ohms. It's a little bit off, uh, but you'll notice that if you um, look around here, there's other, there are other uh, resistors in here that have the silver band, which are 10%. I'm not too concerned about something that's between 5 and 10% off of its spec. Uh, however, if we look at, let me put the backlight back on here just to make sure it shows up on the camera. If we look at this particular one right here, and that's orange, orange, brown, so that's three, three, uh, zero. Um, so that would be 330 ohms we're trying to get at. So let's go ahead and measure that. Now that's coming in at 425. So that is way out. I mean, even though it's silver, for it to be in spec, that would have to be somewhere, you know, it took 330 ohms, 10% of that is 33. The most it should be reading, if it's going to be out, is going to be 363, 300, you know, even 370, a little bit beyond the 10%. But uh, at, at, um, 423 that's that's significantly out of range 424 420 so that's the one this is the resistor that has to come out and be replaced 330 ohm resistor and as I noted earlier we're gonna take this canned resistor uh, the, I'm sorry this uh, multi-section uh, can capacitor out anyway and replace it with some new electrolytics, uh, I have to fabricate that can because it doesn't exist as far as I can tell online based on uh, the ratings of the different parts of the can. So I'm going to fabricate my own. You'll see how I do that. Okay, so here we have the new multi-section 
capacitor coming together, the fabricated version based on what Terry at D-Lab does. And he often talks about this and his key issue is not only saving money, but also coming closer to matching the sort of capacitor that he has to replace. So what you're seeing here right now is the two larger capacitors, the 50 microfarad, 450 volt DC capacitors. Uh, they're going into the top of the tube socket. This is a slightly different tube socket than the one I showed earlier because I needed one with a bracket. And in this case, the bracket exactly matches uh, the bracket that held the other multi-section CAN capacitor in place. So the holes match up perfectly. And I've got some heat shrink wrapped around the two big capacitors, but I haven't applied any heat to it yet. Then in the second photo, you can see that I've got the little tiny capacitor here uh, going in, the third capacitor of the three part multi-section capacitor. This one's 22 microfarads, 25 volts DC. And uh, the leads, the negative leads, uh, for each of the capacitors are going right up the center of the tube socket, whereas the positive leads are going through the pinholes that would normally be occupied by the tube's pins going into this octal socket. Now I took a drill and I drilled through the holes to make a clear passageway through the pinholes for the positive leads and you'll see when we turn it over that that cracked the porcelain and so in the future I probably won't buy porcelain sockets for this purpose I'll probably go with plastic you know the the, the Bakelite ones so here in photo three of the multi-section capacitor you can see the bottom side and you can see the three grounded or the three negative leads coming up the middle for the ground uh, they're together and then you'll notice uh, the positive leads all coming up the sides uh, and they're soldered to some of the tube socket lugs so there should be three of those each soldered to a tube socket lug and you can also see right next to the lugs where the porcelain cracked off a little bit but it's uh, of no consequence in terms of the multi-section capacitor that we're fabricating here so that's no problem and then in this fourth photo you can see that I've taken the three negative leads coming up the middle and I've soldered them uh, by putting them inside of a, uh, a ground lug. Uh, basically um, I, I stole a lug from one part of the socket and just put it over the three and, and uh, put some solder right in there. And so now that can be easily connected to chassis ground. And then in this uh, fifth photo you can see that I've applied the heat to the heat shrink on the two big capacitors and you can also see that I cut a little section of heat shrink that goes around the entire package just enough to cover the little capacitor and so uh, I've heated that one up and so now you've got the complete package on the top and then finally here in this last sixth photo of the multi-section capacitor that I fabricated you can see the new fabricated capacitor sitting next to the old canned multi-section capacitor and so uh, now we'll go back to the signal tracer where we'll drop this capacitor right in. We're back at the signal tracer and we've got the new handy dandy capacitor, a multi-section capacitor installed and let me just kind of review what we did here. I'll just kind of rotate this real so you can see there's the multi-section capacitor. You can see that then I'm just using the little roll of solder to prop her up here so you can see. Okay, and let's uh, zero in a little bit here. Okay, uh, what we've got up here, I don't know if you can see it, but we replaced that 330 ohm resistor and here is that resistor right here that we replaced it was way out and then when I was double checking the uh, other resistors I found that the one that's sort of hidden back here you can see you probably can see the bottom of it uh, right about there 
back out a little bit maybe uh, this little bottom one that's a 330 kilo ohm resistor and it was at about 353 kilo ohms now that is actually within the tolerance level because we were talking about a resistor that was 10% uh, that was this this resistor right here and 10% uh, would have put you at around 366 but I felt like boy that's pretty close we were you know 20 kilo ohm, 20 kilo ohms out of tolerance or you know off the 330 and it was you know only had a few more to go before it would have been completely out of tolerance so I replaced that one too so this one is one of the ones that goes to ground. Here's the ground lug of my multi-section capacitor in the middle. Fairly sizable glob of solder there, but I've got a lot of wires going to it, as you can see. And one of those wires kind of cuts through one of the, uh, the, the tube socket lugs here. Remember, this was previously a tube socket and goes right here. So you get a nice chassis-based ground for it. So uh, the whole thing is together now. Um, as you can see, the, the, the screws, the screw holes for the tube socket matched up perfectly right here. So that was really good too. It was just great to be able to fit it right in. And uh, we've got everything basically connected up. Um, this little bit of wiring here was connected to an old lug on the previous multi-section socket and rather than pull it all apart I just soldered that whole lug right onto the socket lug. Not the prettiest but um, incredibly effective and saved me some time and there was no real incredible compelling reason to do it in a different way. So uh, some of the resistors are reused. Um, obviously this one here, these, these couple guys over here are still, uh, they were still almost perfect. Uh, and so now we've got it in place. The next thing we'll do is we'll start to put it back together and we'll get it up on the isolation transformer and the Variac to uh, start to bring it up and bring it back to life and see what happened. Well, all right, well, here comes the moment of truth. Uh, I've got the signal tracer here set up and uh, the first thing I'll do is uh, we'll bring it up on the Variac now, interestingly, you know, I was wondering why the guy who owned this before had electrical tape that was wrapped around the magic eye tube. And the reason was, is that the clip that holds the magic eye tube doesn't do a very good job of it. So I'm going to have to figure out something to uh, position the magic eye tube in a way that uh, it's better centered. I, I stuck a piece of electrical tape. I followed his lead, but um, it's not really working that well. So I'm going to figure that out. Uh, and then uh, once we figure out whether this is working or not. So how do we, how are we going to get this working first? Let's get our probe here. And I'll connect my probe up. Here we go. So the probe is connected probe right there. And maybe we can back out a little bit so we can see a little more of what's going on. And then what we'll do is we'll uh, plug it into the Variac and we'll see, we'll bring it up slowly and also we're plugged into an isolation transformer. So this is really an important piece of safety with the isolation transformer and the Variac. The isolation transformer of course uh, keeps uh, it, it's, a, it's a measure of safety so that um, I can't complete a circuit to ground and uh, electrocute myself because we don't want to do that. And then the other, uh, the, the Variac helps bring up all the electronics slowly in case something pops or starts smoking, we can t uh, dial it back pretty quickly and uh, without applying the full 120 volts of house voltage to this unit. So uh, 
let's go ahead now um, I've got the noise um, circuit off and this is something we're not going to test today only because I don't have an amplifier opened up here to test it with uh, the speaker is set to on We've got the volume down We've got the, uh, the vo this is this adjusts the amplification factor and so we'll get to see if it does if it works at all and then of course the uh, on off switch so let's start off by uh, plugging this into the variac stand up here and uh, plug it in actually we're plugging it into the isolation transformer which is downstream from the variac and uh, let's go ahead and turn our uh, variac on and right now nothing and so because uh, we're at zero what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn some lights out here I'm going to turn this around so hopefully you can see the back of it and we can see if we're going to if we get any uh, action on the tubes so let's go ahead and get that like that and uh, I'm using this little thing just to prop it up and that's for weight so let's see if we can kind of get in there a little bit tough to see right now because it's a little dark let's go ahead and bring bring the uh, variac up though well, let's go ahead and turn it on first so on and let's see what we get here I'm going to bring it up about to 50 and see what we get. And I don't see anything happening yet. It's nothing. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. I see the... 12AX7 starting to heat up right here. So I'm getting, seeing some signs of life. I don't know if, uh, if I turn this off, we'll be able to see anything. It's kind of dark. Let's leave it on for now. Let me go ahead and bring it up a little more. Uh, we're now at 120. And hopefully, if you can see in there, right there, there's the the 12AX7 glowing pretty brightly. So that's pretty nice. And this is pretty quiet. I don't hear any hum. I hear a little bit of hum. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. So we're getting some signs of life there. Oh, and look, I can see the, the magic eye tube. So let's turn it around and get a view of the magic eye tube here. Let's see what we get there. And keep that propped up. So let's zoom back out. And look at, look at there. The magic eye tube is is glowing pretty brightly. I still have to figure out how to position it. Okay. Let's put this light back on here. Maybe turn this one off. Just so we can see that magic eye tube a little bit better. That's, we need more light. Well, you can see the magic eye tube is working pretty nicely. Okay, let's put this light back on. Maybe back it up a little bit, turn it away. All right, so, so far, so good. Uh, let's turn the volume up. Well, we'll get some hum there. That might be picking up, that might be the, oh yeah, so we're, we're just picking up, it's 
probably the ground loop wire, something picking up all the fluorescent hum here. Let's now do a little test. So I'm going to turn on my signal generator. And right now my signal generator is set for uh, one, one, kilohertz, a one kilohertz signal. So let's go ahead and uh, connect up. We'll connect the ground side here. All right. And you can see the tube, the magic eye tube is open right now. So what we're going to test for is when we touch the probe to this other wire here, which is connect. Well, wait a minute. Look at that. We're not even touching it and it's picking up. The Look, that's how sensitive it is. That's pretty amazing. So let's turn the volume up and see what we get. Wow. We're not even touching it. And the sensitivity, the, this gives you some idea of why we're probably hearing the hum around here. The probe is so sensitive, it's picking up everything. It's like an antenna. And we don't even, we don't even have it switched into the uh, radio mode. It's just in the audio mode. But let's go ahead and now what we're going to look for is I'm going to connect it's a little loud let's turn it down so there's plenty of amplification if you can see the I'm turn it down a little bit the magic eye tube magic eye tube is closed so we're getting, the magic eye tube is working pretty well right there. And boy, I only have it turned up to like three. Just gives you an idea of how loud this thing is going to get. I can't even turn it up to 10. It gets too loud. And so there you have it. I mean, that's working nearly perfectly. Now, if I turn the speaker off. Okay, now we have the visual on the magic eye tube. Doesn't. Yep. So that's one of the advantages. You don't have to listen to the speaker. You can just look at your magic eye tube. Let's turn it down a little bit. So I think this pot's a little scratchy, so I'll clean it up on the back. And then the last thing we want to do, oh, what's that? Okay, the last thing we want to do is we're going to turn this off. Okay. And what I want to check is when it's off, one of the features of this. One of the nice features of this uh, signal tracer is that you can also just use the speaker. So let's go ahead and that will work whether it's plugged in or not. You don't need the power. So let's go ahead and just connect the leads to, this, to the speaker terminal here. So you can just use it as a speaker like that. And that works perfectly. So if you wanted to, you could just connect your amplifier while the amplifier itself is on. And you can uh, use the speaker. Now this is a 4 ohm speaker, so it's not offering the, the full 8 ohm impedance that you see in a lot of amplifiers, but at this point, um, I'm going to uh, declare this a successful repair. Of course, that is, you know, I'm not testing all of the features, but uh, one of the things that I will need to test, I don't have a radio apart right now, is whether or not the uh, 
it works in the radio mode for probing radi radios. So if we go back and we look at the the probe here, right? It's got a it has a uh, audio. The switch has got an audio direction. Audio. Pull this light up a little bit more here. And then RF radio frequency. So uh, I'm not testing it for that yet. My assumption is it's going to work because the only difference between these two is, is that you've got a crystal inside here uh, when it's on radio frequency to tune in uh, to whatever's on the circuit in the radio. Uh, but it may not work. Who knows? But uh, since I don't have a radio uh, ready for repair here, I mean, I have dozens of radios ready to go in terms of uh, ones that need work on them, but I don't have any of them open at the time. So that's it. I'm going to wrap this up and declare it a success. I'm going to straighten out this magic eye tube a little bit before I put the case back on. Okay, I'm back with a little bit more of a surprise. I'm not done yet. I thought I was done, but I decided I was going to make one more change, and that was uh, to put a three-prong plug on it. So here's the plug, and as you can see, it's going in there. It's got a little bit of a strain relief on the other side, and I uh, figured as long as I was in there, I might as well also make it a nice, safe instrument. One other thing I wanted to point out, by the way, is that when, um, you know, the reason I did the BNC connector, uh, not only can I use this probe here, which is a great probe, as we saw, now it just clips on and off like that, but I can use like one of these things too. So there's a little banana jack connector, and once I have the banana jack on like that, then I can uh, hook up some banana jack probes to this and just hard, you know, uh, may maybe they'll have alligator clips on the other end or something like that, and I can just hard connect it. Because uh, there might be some instances where I need something like that as opposed to where I'm just probing around. So that's another really big benefit of going with the BNC connector here. So all in all, uh, it's been uh, a, a lot of fun getting this back up to snuff. And I'll be using this uh, quite a bit if, across my lab because I have a lot of gear that is failing somewhere in the circuit. I don't know where, and this will help me pretty much identify exactly where that is. Now, I could do it with an oscilloscope, too. Uh, you know, you could probe around with an oscilloscope, but this is really quick. You know, you hook your alligator clip up, and then you just take your probe, and boom, you're done. So that's it. Uh, if you think you like this video and you stuck with it till the end, thank you for staying, and Maybe click the like button, give it a thumbs up. That way other people will start to find my videos and uh, appreciate the work that I'm doing. Again, I don't make any money on these. I don't have nearly enough subscribers to even turn the monetization of my channel on. So I'm not making money doing this. And I, I don't think I ever will. I'm just trying to share what I learn. Uh, and, and hopefully other people will benefit from it. So there you go. Uh, click the like button. If you really like what I'm doing with my videos, click the subscribe button. And I'll see you at the next video. From Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Dave the Ant Mechanic. I'll see you at the next video. Mm -hmm.